Ja. Was going? Sorry? Oh, okay. Oh, the guys are there? Yeah. Okay. So we'll start now. Welcome to Sri Ram's second Chandrasekhar <laughs> lecture. Uh, the allure of active matter. Okay. okay, I'll pick up where I left off last time. And now what I can't remember is if I, I think as a result of the questions from Rajesh, I entered a little bit into the question of uh, active motion in a fluid medium. And uh, very quickly what I did was to point out that uh, an aligned state of swimmers is invariably unstable if uh, the fluid's response can be described by the Stokes equation. That is to say where forces everywhere produce flows everywhere instantly. And that means that uh, you can't have in a bulk liquid, as long as you're in the regime of the Stokes equation, you can't have an active ordered liquid crystalline state on big scales. And so what I want to do is to jump ahead and say that uh, on the other hand, you know that if you are in a regime definitely not described by the Stokes equation, if you are working at speeds and at length scales such that basically the Reynolds number at the scale of one of the organisms itself is order one or here order a very big number, I don't know how much, um, clearly it seems to be perfectly possible to make coherent flocks of swimmers. So, the question really is, how much inertia do you... So presumably the reason these things are stable is not because uh, they've entered into some conspiracy with each other or something, but just because the laws of physics, the same laws of physics that told you you couldn't have stable flocks at small scales uh, of slow swimmers, somehow tells you that you can have stable flocks in fluid at large scales with fast swimmers. Now, these swimmers are so fast that you wouldn't apply... You wouldn't dream of applying a minor modification to the Stokes equation. So you can, but we're going at it from the other end. Since we know that Stokesian flocks are unstable, the question is, you know, can you add just a little bit of inertia and make things, and stabilize things? Okay, so let's actually confront that problem and say that I have a fluid, I have a suspension, um, described in principle by a concentration field and an orientation field and a hydrodynamic velocity field. And just to make ideas very clear, when we say the velocity field, we mean the joint velocity field of particles in fluid. I'm not going to say this is the velocity of the particles, that's the velocity of solvent, it's the velocity of the suspension. Um, I'm going to be a little lazy and ignore the fact that there is a concentration field. I'm going to pretend somehow, if you want to do it formally and mathematically, you have to have birth and death in order to make the concentration fast. I'm not going to do any of that, I'm just going to uh, sort of live in denial and keep just a, uh, a, an orientation field and a velocity field and look at the dynamics. And the dynamics, as described last time, is that the orientation can advect itself. The fluid velocity can, the, uh, can also advect the orientation. Uh, the uh, vorticity can reorient and uh, uh, shear can align. And you have a free energy functional which favors uh, or, uh, P trying to order orientationally. The other part of the story is that these swimmers create stresses. Those stresses at the simplest level are simply bilinear in the orientation order parameter. Uh, I don't remember which sign of sigma A my talk applies to, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and this stress goes in there. There are also stresses from the mechanics of the liquid crystalline order. There's viscosity, pressure. And we will keep track of the fact that these, the, flu, the fluid has a mass density, and therefore inertia matters on some scale. Uh, it, will it turns out that over the range that we studied, uh, the uh, nonlinearities associated with the flow don't matter. So really, the operative part of this dynamics is simply unsteadiness. Okay. So you can think of it as we, we will not worry about U dot radu linearized Navier-Stokes, and that makes a big difference. Okay, it turns out that if you do this, um, there's an important combination. Okay, I claim once you have motility, a non-zero mass density, 
and the active stress buried in here. There's an important dimensionless number, which on the face of it looks like the ratio of some kind of inertial stress and active stress, but is much better viewed as the ratio of the squares of two velocities. The motility squared divided by sigma over rho, you know the ratio of a stress to a density, taking the, if you take the square root of it, is a speed. So there's one speed which I claim is the invasion speed of the instability, and there is the self-propulsion speed. Now, why do I call this the invasion speed of the instability? It is because if I take these equations, linearize about an aligned state, introduce perturbations and watch them grow, then those perturbations actually grow. Remember I told you back here that the perturbations simply, where is it gone? Simply grow with a single time scale. The growth rate is active stress over viscosity. That's fine if you have, if you ignore inertia altogether. The moment you take inertia into account, the growth rate is actually linear in wave number at small wave numbers. So supposing you didn't have motility, okay, and then the growth rate would be linear in wave number with a coefficient, apart from this flow aligning parameter, the coefficient given by the ratio of active stress to mass density, square root thereof. That's the speed. What is that speed telling you? That's telling you on a length scale 1 over q, how long does an initial perturbation take to grow by one e-fold, let's say, okay? Grow by order one. And so the bigger the scale is, the longer it takes disturbances on that scale to grow. So the point, therefore, is once you take inertia into account, this instantaneous, uh, uh, you know, Newton, Newtonian gravity-like response to the fluid now has a lag due to inertia, and you get a kind of meaningful, you, you can see, by the way, if you go to the zero density limit, this coefficient becomes infinity and the growth is instant, okay? If you, you can do a better scaling treatment of it, but, right? And that's important because what it means, and so now you agree, now it turns, now you agree that at order Q, if you just do the algebra, you get a competition between this term, which is the disturbance running with the motility speed, and this term, which is the disturbance trying to reach order one on that same length scale, okay? And that's, that's the competition, and that competition is clearly described by looking at this quantity. If this quantity is order one or bigger, you can imagine that the Stokesian description is not very good. And so, in fact, what happens is if you now calculate the growth rate of disturbances as a function of wave number, if this Reynolds-like number, it, it's not obvious that I should call it a Reynolds number, but if the swimmer is roughly a viscous-like object, if you imagine the active stress is something like the viscosity times some speed divided by some particle size or something, then uh, whatever it is will be essentially the Reynolds number. Right? But in general, you can think of this as an in independent material parameter. You don't necessarily ascribe a viscous meaning to it, okay? And so you have a competition between these two things. In general, anyway, these are independent parameters because if you, if you think in terms of, uh, you know, a force dipole swimmer, the force dipole strength determines the active stress. Some higher moment of the force distribution determines the motility. So you're okay in treating these as independent. And you can see that if you swim fast enough, this coefficient becomes positive, so that square root becomes real, and you no longer have that growing mode. So in other words, at zero Reynolds, you have a growth rate that goes to, is non-zero at zero uh, wave number. At non-zero, but small values of this quantity, the instability is still there, but if you zoom on this bit, it's linear in wave number. It's this red dashed line, okay? If you go past um, the, uh, if you increase the motility enough, this instability goes away, but now you find you're in a regime of another instability. And then it's, so this linear in wave number behavior is replaced by a quadratic in wave number behavior. Eventually, if your speed is large enough, the system no longer has a linear instability at all. And how large? Essentially large enough, meaning order one. So you don't have to swim furiously fast. You have to have a sort of Reynolds number of order one at your body scale, okay? So uh, 
what one thought of as a completely inescapable instability of aligned suspensions is merely one extreme edge of a much bigger picture. And this is at a, the level of linear stability analysis, this is that bigger picture. Okay? And the result, if you now take the next step, which is not worry about linear stability analysis, put, it on, put the equations on the computer, what you find is in principle, three kinds of states. One where all disturbances, so ignore this axis, just take a vertical cut through this anywhere, let us say here. At large enough values of motility, you're stable. All perturbations decay linear, all, all small perturbations decay. In between, you have perturbations that decay, uh, that grow, but slowly. At lower values of motility, you have perturbations that grow fast. And here it turns out you get a state which, is, which has disturbances that grow for a bit, then somehow nonlinearities fix it, and you seem to retain order. Okay? So here, for this particular model, completely dead state, that is, you know, uh, all disturbances decay, growing disturbances, but nonlinearity seems to fix it, something like phase turbulence, and here, a defect ridden mess, uh, uh, defect turbulence. Okay? Uh, and you can do this, study this numerically in two or in three dimensions. You can see the defects that dominate because in this system, inertia is important, polarity is important, motility is important, and active stresses are important. Yeah. Right. And you go from defect turbulence to a still noisy but basically ordered state. And you know, you can see what the movies look like if you like. Many of them, many of you have seen these before. Jump ahead a little bit and see. Plus one defects and minus one defects all over the place. The phase turbulence state is somehow less clear, but numerically it sort of makes a bit of noise. And then sometimes you see some defects, sometimes you don't, depends a little on initial conditions, but on the whole it kind of writes itself. Okay. Not so very clear. But on average, you see an ordered state. And you can measure the order parameter, and you find that as you increase motility, you go from a state where the order parameter is zero to where it seems to be non-zero. As you approach it, correlations decay more and more slowly with distance. There's a modest growth of correlation length by a factor of a few. Notice I plotted one over the correlation length against one over that uh, Reynolds-like parameter. And it seems to approach extrapolated. It appears to be going to infinity at what? are of order one. Okay, all right. So, yes. Yeah, so the point is, you know, this, once you incl include the concentration, the problem becomes far richer. What Prasad talked about yesterday was an interesting example of what happens, which is in Purnima's poster. Many other things happen. There's also other work we've done, which uh, with, uh, with the Navdeep and so forth. With the concentration field, everything is more interesting, more complicated. And this super simple picture with this phase turbulence state in between may not survive all that, but it's really nice to see it even in this simplified realization. Okay, so uh, this is all I wanted to say about flocking uh, for today. So I've, you know, I've told you about it. This is really the end of lecture one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so for the um, for the phase turbulence state yeah. or or the fully stable and ordered state, yeah. if you were to estimate this Reynolds number like thing for fish. Of. I think fish are way, way, uh, very high, right? Because if something is about a meter long and swimming at a meter a second, I mean, some big fish or something. Okay, so uh, there, there, the the nonlinearity of the Navier-Stokes equation will also. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, and I think so. And the point is there, the high, you know, you know what happens, right? Slow swimmers have a disturbance field that's kind of all around, and what's happening here really is that you are outrunning your disturbance field, but there's still a disturbance field around you, right? If you're swimming. If your Reynolds is 10 to the water, 5 or 6, whatever it is for fish, that whole disturbance, viscous disturbance field is, is only in a small wake behind you. Uh, the people over here hardly know, I mean, they sense you through the lateral line, through pressure fields, but the viscous hydrodynamics is somehow squeezed into a wake, and I, I, I feel hesitant to apply this analysis on those scales. The main point here is modest speeds are already enough to stabilize. What about uh, yeah. zebrafish or yeah? So I think uh, anchovies. I think you need. 
I think you need little fish in a big pond okay. uh, uh, to study this. I, I, I experimentally, I, I really love it if somebody could come up with a system. You need a system where you can vary the speed since you can't vary the mass density. Um, hmm? Yeah, so I've talked to Vishu a lot. Uh, huh? Tadpoles, yeah, so you know, tadpoles is probably a reasonable thing. Uh, but you also, you probably need variables, variable speed tadpoles, and I don't know how you're going to do that. Or maybe, you, should, you know, sorry. I, so, but I mean, I, I think there's a real interesting experimental challenge here. Theoreticians always call it a challenge when they make a prediction for which it's very difficult to come up with an experimental system. Okay. So, I, I don't want can to I, say anything more I, about flocks. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, on uh, that previous uh, topic, what right. happens if you have a boundary? Do you have any sort of non-Hermitian skin modes uh, there because you have, uh, you know, these... Uh, uh, I think probably even for simpler problems, even for dry flocks with boundaries, there must be all kinds of physics. We haven't thought about boundaries at all for this problem. Yeah, I think there are... I mean, you, know, you, you remember the, the granular flock in a, in a dry granular flock of things. There also you saw that the system was tending to hang about at the boundary a lot. Yeah, so I think closed geometries tend to give rise to these... Uh, to, to boundary modes. I, even if the system is not chiral, I think you get them. And if they're chiral, then you get them a lot. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, so, I mean, as I said, the major reason for showing this uh, is that I'd really like someone to apply their minds to the question of how one might test this. Okay. So that ends, actually, lecture one. And now for something completely different. As, uh, I'm not going to follow it with the rest of that sentence, for those of you who are old enough to know what the rest of that line is. Okay, so uh, there's a problem in um, non-equilibrium physics studied with these characters, including uh, Rahul, who was the joint student of all of us, and who is now a postdoc with Manu Prakash. Um, uh, actually, probably the first, you know, before, before we started working on active matter, matter the problem of sedimentation was something that I spent a lot of time on. I'm going to tell you two little problems in sedimentation, uh, both of which have something like an active matter flavor uh, for reasons that you'll see as I go along. And this will also build a bridge to lecture three where I'm going to talk about non-normal or non-reciprocal dynamics. So as I said, I've sort of rather uh, contrivedly and tendentiously connected the three lectures by some kind of thread. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. So I've put in various catch lines that I hope will attract, and I've forgotten to end the quote there, but anyway. Um, all right. So this is what this lecture is going to be about. You know that George Gabriel Stokes, so recently, by the way, he, he turned 200 and something recently. Um, and he solved this problem for one sphere settling in a fluid. Okay. Uh, and we're going to continue to work in the regime in which he worked. We're, now we're going back to no inertia. Okay, we're going to study this problem. And uh, you know that the flow field uh, around one sphere decays at large distances as 1 over r. You know, and or you, maybe you don't know, and this is the, the first important slide of this talk, is that what I'm interested in is not the sedimentation of one sphere, Given that one sphere produces a 1 over r velocity field, it means that the problem of two or more spheres is, even though the Stokes equations are themselves linear, it's the problem of particles interacting rather strongly at rather long distances, right? And the problem of many spheres or many objects settling in a fluid is a, prob a strongly interacting, strongly and long range interacting problem. The heart of that problem is already seen in this interaction between two objects that are settling. You know that two spheres settle, okay, what's been written down here is the force as, you know, given a velocity and the coefficient of drag decreases uh, as you, have I got the A's and B's right here? Yes, A is the size of D's, yeah. So the closer together they are, the slower the drag. Okay, so two objects for a given for a given weight, two objects settle faster. Okay, and the other point to make is that if you have two objects that are not necessarily at the same height, they're at a tilt, they don't settle straight down; they settle at an angle. 
okay? <coughs> this is mutual drag reduction, that's the line of center's force. Okay, and, and it's, it's also true that the, verti the vertical component of the settling speed will be less, and that will be even in this angle, because whether you settle this way or you settle this way, your vertical speed will be equally. And so, and three particles is already chaotic. And what happens is that two of them pair off and the third runs off or something like that. I think I even have, okay, first experimental movie. I hope it works. No, no, it may not be there. I'm not worried. Let's see. This is not spheres. This happens to be disks. Three disks settling. So you can see already the disks do a bit of what spheres do, but there's other cool stuff going on. The disks have an, in an internal degree of freedom, namely their tilt. And it's the interplay of this internal degree of freedom of the tilt of the disk with the basic physics of sedimenting objects. That's going to be the subject of this talk. Okay. So now if you have, okay, I should go again. Now if you have an array of spheres, and there was this J.M. Crowley, who was working at Xerox Palo Alto and for some reason dropping ball bearings in vats of turpentine oil 50 years ago. Uh, and he observed and argued that the following thing should happen, that because of the mechanism I told you, because of two spheres settling faster than one, and because of tilted objects settling laterally, you can see that if you perturb this region, let us say you bring two of these guys to, slightly closer together, they'll settle faster. Because they settle faster, this region will now have a tilt. That tilt will make things move towards each other and you'll get this. You can understand this completely from the pair dynamics that I showed you on the previous slide. And I think maybe I'll just show you. Hello? It was supposed to be there. Let's see. Ah, okay, it's good enough. This is not a great movie, but it's, it'll, this is Rahul's experiment. One of Rahul's experiments. And you can see the phenomenon happening. Okay. So this is all still spheres. Um, this problem actually gave rise to a really fun set of questions in statistical physics with my student, the late Rangon Lahiri, which we worked on with Mustansir, um, which I'll mention briefly. So anyway, the point is this. If you really want to study this, sedimentation is a many-body, long-range statistical mechanics problem because even three-particle settling is already chaotic. So many-particle settling is certainly chaotic. And these are big particles. The randomness is not their Brownian motion because these are particles, uh, you know, millimeters, centimeters in size. Or, you know, once you are above about 20 or 30 microns, you can forget about uh, anything. Once you're above 10 microns, you can forget about anything Brownian. So there are many interesting statistical physics problems in here. For instance, each particle settling produces a big scale flow. Many particles settling will produce flows with all kinds of correlations. There's this big question of the variance of velocity in such a system and how it's screened. I won't talk about any of that. I'll talk about a slightly different question. Imagine, now forget about sedimentation as such. Imagine you have a bunch of objects moving through some kind of medium which has some kind of damping. Then all you know is that if, now so for, don't think sedimentation, but do think that there is a medium. Because there's a medium, if you've got a bunch of particles together, their settling speed in general, on general symmetry grounds, is allowed to depend on whether they're close together or far apart. Let's assume they settle faster. You, they could either settle faster when they're together or slower. They could, and two parts, increasing their, bring them closer together would make them settle faster or slower, and tilting them could make, make, them, make them drift this way or this way. There's four possibilities, right? And basically there's two pairs of possibilities. So, you could imagine that, let us say, settling, getting together makes them settle faster, but you could imagine that a tilted region, for some reason, likes to drift laterally that way. Meaning, forgetting about the fluid dynamics of a Stokesian fluid, just in general, symmetry allows an object that's tilted this way. So, an object that's tilted this way, and it knows down from up, therefore knows right from left. But all you can say is, it should have a component of its settling speed, either this way or this way. If you had a system that did this, then what, you would have, what would happen is if you brought a few of these particles together and let it go, little waves would travel outwards, right? Can you get that in any physical system? Turns out that you can. If you work this out, 
not for spheres in a fluid, but for point vortices in a 2D flux lattice. Aditi showed many years ago. You can, you have to write down, you take the uh, uh, ginzburg landau equations and work out the, the dynamics of vortices. And what you find is that you find this scenario. Nobody has ever looked for it in experiments because experiments, I think, are dominated by disorder and other interesting things, as Christina will tell you. Okay. As a result, though, as a function of, imagine treating the parameter, I like uh, drifting to the left versus drifting to the right as a continuously variable parameter. If positive, it does one thing. If negative, it does the other. Right? So you get a phase diagram like this. On one side, you get clumping. In fact, you get a very dramatic kind of phase separation within those models that we studied. On the other side, you get something else. You get waves. And it turns out that the scaling behavior on this side uh, is governed by the KPZ equation. And the behavior on this side is an exceptionally strong kind of phase separation. And there's an exceptional point phase transition everywhere on this line. So this is the link to non-reciprocal physics and so forth. Because what's happening is, the vertical displacement has horizontal consequences. So it's some kind of odd mechanics. Okay. So this is why, in my head, the sedimentation problem and odd mechanics are sort of tied up together. So this is a really fun class of problems, uh, which uh, sort of has always stayed in my head and is the motivation for the rest of today's uh, talk. Okay. So let me tell you uh, first. So, so that's the background motivation, connection to active matter. One way of thinking of all this stuff as active matter is that basically what you have is, you know, a tilted object, whether it's a pair of spheres or one disk, you can think of, you know, once you know down from up, if you have an object tilted this way, you can assign, consistently assign an arrow this way or this way. And an arrow pointing this way, because it's a driven system, leads to a velocity in this direction. So if you think of the horizontal tilt as a kind of polarization variable in the plane, that object, if you project its dynamics onto the horizontal plane, is kind of like a motile object. Okay? The energy input is it's drawing its energy from gravity, it's dissipating it in the fluid, and moving laterally. So that's the further sort of, again, admittedly tendentious connection to active matter. All right. So this is one fun story that we did. So the question, therefore, is if you, instead of two spheres, uh, you want to look at two disks. Again, the, the history is that Rahul came to me as a summer, Rahul Chajwa came to me as a summer student, came to us as a summer student of 20, I don't know, 13, 12, I can't remember. And we suggested that he works on sedimentation. So he went out and bought, bought oil that it turned out the supplier gave him oil that was 10 times as viscous as what we needed. Given what you know about time scales in viscous fluids, you can imagine it would have taken him 50 years to get his PhD. Luckily, this was discovered well in time, well before a large fraction of the 50 years had elapsed. So the question is basically, imagine you had two disks rather than um, two spheres. What happens? So now you can see there's one vector associated with this line, line joining these two guys and another vector associated with just the normal, right? So this is an, you know, an a, a pair of apolar objects settling in a fluid. And uh, so the experiments are like this. You have this big tank. This is seriously macro physics. It's half a meter, 30 centimeters. The width is small. The width being small is useful for various reasons. One is you can see all the way in. Secondly, even though this is not an exact statement, you can ignore the hydrodynamic interaction on very large scales. Okay, it's not real screening because you know that if you have a force monopole between two walls, it's still, it's, it's no longer a Stokes lead, but it's a Blake lead and has a long range velocity field, but less long range. And we're going to work for the most part in a limit where we ignore that. For this problem, actually, well, anyway, we'll come and see. Um, so this is, the, you know, this is the kind of material. Um, and let's say the initial separation is D, initial angle is theta. This problem, as a problem in, uh, what is it called, microhydrodynamics, has been studied to death by people who do that kind of thing. But we had a sort of amusing angle on it. Um, let me see, maybe this is the same movie, it's a different movie, I don't know. Or maybe the movie doesn't exist. Well, anyway, you can kind of see, this is the kind of physics that, that we, we thought we discovered, but it turned out that Mike Shelley and group knew a lot about this, although 
uh, they hadn't analyzed it in detail. Okay, so you can see there's a tumbling. You can also see that if they're close to each other, there's a tumbling dynamics. If you, so everything depends on how close they are initially. If they're close enough to each other, they stay paired and they tumble. They form a bound state and they keep tumbling. If they're farther apart, and let's look at simple cases where they're both initial conditions are symmetric, okay? If they're farther, so even if you keep them dead vertical, it's not a question of instability, keep them dead vertical because the fluid flow is different inside from outside. They end up tilting, tumble, 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 tumble. If you have them slightly farther apart, they take a longer time over it. Far enough apart, they seem never to, they part never to meet again. So actually one of the first things we didn't understand, couldn't tell from the literature, was whether this is a real transition or what. Uh, and we just wrote down sort of stupid simple-minded theory based on hydrodynamics, based on Stokes hydrodynamics. And so it's, it's sort of trivial physics, but it has various entertaining analogies. So left is when they're very close together, right is when they're farther apart. They stay together and they oscillate. This guy, I guess these guys are both, no, this, this guy is going apart, but I'll show you a more convincing uh, scattering orbit later. This is probably better. So here's where you can see that there's clearly two behaviors, bound tumbling and scattering. And there's other behaviors which you may as well look at. You can also, if you start them asymmetrically, you can get stuff that won't complete an orbit, it'll come back around. Okay, and you know, basically you can ask for this wavelength equivalently the period, and there's also the sort of the size of the, you know, how far they, they go far apart, come together, far apart, come together. And what you find is that this guy, the period, grows as a function of the minimum separation. The amplitude grows as a function of minimum separation. There seems to be a transition purely from, this is all experimental by the way. Um, and then you realize that you can actually work on this problem. You can just take more or less known Stokesian dynamics studies, okay? What do you do? You say, uh, okay, this, sorry, I think I defined my variables several slides ago. Confusingly, we are measuring this angle from this direction and this angle from this direction, okay? So that, uh, yeah, so theta one minus theta two is the variable of interest and there's a separation. And so the, to a first approximation, all you want to know is, can you draw orbits in the x theta plane? Okay. You can actually take the Stokes solutions, and the way we do it is the following. We just say that, we do something very simple-minded and far-field, okay? Here is one disk, here is another disk. We look at the flow field, gen so this is one, to the, we look at the velocity field generated by one, by, by at two due to one. This we do as just a Stokes led. That is to say, we ignore the fact that this guy is a disk when we're looking at its velocity field here. Okay? Why? Because we just, all we want to know is what is the gradient of this velocity field, and we'll analyze how this tumbles based on the gradient of that velocity field. Okay? And. Uh, you know, do a, a little bit of elementary patchwork like that. You can write down. Yeah. So you can work out the Stokes hydrodynamics. The solution, in fact, is already in the literature. Okay. The solution for the orbit parameter, orbits, x as a function of theta looks exactly like something you would have studied in your first year undergraduate mechanics. It's Kepler orbits, okay? The funny thing is the gravitational interaction for the Kepler orbit, the role of the gravitational interaction is played by the Stokes hydrodynamic interaction here, okay? And um, it turns out you can actually rewrite this problem as 
a canonical dynamics of an x and a theta. The theta, the til theta is clearly standing in for the momentum, and you actually have this nice dynamics. You have a kind of potential energy term, which is roughly speaking theta squared, and you have a potential. I mean, the kinetic energy term is roughly theta squared, and a potential which is one over x, and you have Newtonian. You have you have Kepler orbits. Okay, this is fine for symmetric. You know, so this is what the problem looks like. You can plot x versus theta, and you can get bound orbits, and you can get scattering orbits. You can measure the period as a function of the amplitude, amplitude meaning orbit radius, and you find that the period squared goes as the radius cubed, uh, a law which you may be familiar with. Okay, and you can plot orbits and all this stuff. So it's great fun. You can, even if your pair is, uh, if you have a tilted pair, asymmetric pair, you can still use, if this is one disk and that's another disk, and one disk is horizontal and the other is at some angle theta plus, uh, you can use this distance between these guys and still find an effective Hamiltonian. And uh, you can get, again, a canonical dynamics for this system. And so that transition from bound orbits to scattering orbits with disk pair was just the transition, the same transition in Kepler orbits from, you know, elliptical to uh, parabolic, hyperbolic orbits. Okay. Uh, the, you can understand these other more amusing kinds of orbits also from uh, this elementary theory. So really, the summary of the two-disc problem is that, you know, in some sense, the tilt angle acts like a momentum. You get an effective canonical dynamics of these variables. Uh, and you have, by the way, this family of orbits has a different law. You have a family of orbits, these uh, asymmetric orbits where the period goes as the amplitude cube. So there's a limit. The symmetric case is properly the Kepler problem, but there's a larger family of dynamics as well. So that's just, that is sort of complete fun and games only. I mean, the rest of it is also fun and games, but it's a more, slight, marginally more challenging problem. In this problem, what we want to know is, can, so you, I think I have a cartoon somewhere. Um, well, yeah. So basically, if these were spheres, they would undergo that clumping instability that I told you about. The question is, now that they're disks, oh, sorry, there's a line up here which must be the line above which one shouldn't write. Um, oh, it doesn't matter. Let me just say it from here. Because the disk, what we're asking basically is, can the lateral, if you have a disk that's tilted like this, it moves in one direction. So can the tilt of the disks compete with the drift of the pairs of the centers of mass in such a way as to actually nullify the linear instability that we had earlier? Can you get, can you merely by changing the shape of the particles, can you somehow miraculously produce a, set, a collection of particles that will settle smoothly? And that if you perturb them slightly, maybe uh, rather than having a growing mode will you know, oscillate and restore its position. Can that happen? Um, we already talked about this. Uh, the challenge, as I said, basically, can you make a stably sedimenting array? Can you, can, you, can you somehow compete with this line of centers disks, a uh, drift using the fact that these are disks? Okay. So now, you know, on, let's say you associate with each of these disks its normal vector k. Clearly, all the dynamics has to be symmetric under k to minus k. So now write down equations of motion for the horizontal displacement, the vertical displacement, and the orientation vector. And if you write these equations down, so remember, if I throw away the coupling to k, this bit goes back to the Crowley problem. Okay? Horizontal speed is proportional to tilt. Vertical speed is proportional, changes with compression or dilation. That's what, that's, this is pairs settle faster. This is tilt results in lateral drift. Can the little arrows, the, 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 can the fact that a tilted object, an individual tilted object, as distinct from the displacement of a pair, uh, can it compete? Okay. And this is, the, this is the form, you can guess this form of the dynamics on general grounds, rotation invariance in the horizontal space, symmetry under inversion of orientations, and what you find 
is a dispersion relation that looks like this. We know for the settling spheres problem that the product lambda 1, lambda 2 is negative. That's why this frequency has an imaginary part. Therefore, you get a growing mode. Tantalizingly, it looks like this coefficient can compete because if you actually think about which way the disks go, it turns out that this will actually be positive. Okay? Alpha times gamma is positive if you ask yourself how the disks settle. Okay? It's interesting, the fact that the Stokes equations have this weird time reversibility and the fact there's a k going to minus k symmetry means there's actually no uh, restoring torque for the k's themselves in the k equation. If you introduce that, you're spoiling the Stokes time reversal symmetry. That's a separate technical issue. Okay? So here's the idea. Basically, if you have disks undergoing the same process, these guys are tilted outwards, necessarily and therefore they should drift outwards. So this pair will want to drift inward, but the flow, if you bring these two guys close together, there's more flow on the outside, it'll tilt it outwards, okay? So generically, a settling array of disks uh, has the potential to be stable, okay? So you can write this dynamics down, uh, include the fact that the disk moves laterally. So the x velocity has a contribution from the tilt of the disk. Don't worry too much about the equations. I'm just restating what I said in words, what I said in the previous slide. The horizontal velocity has a component from the tilt of each guy. Uh, the line of center's drift is this bit. The fact that a flow reorients a disk is from this term. Remember the velocity is 1 over r. Gradients of velocity are 1 over r squared. This has a 1 over r squared form, x1 is x2 over r cube. So you patch this all together. You can patch this all together. Don't, again, I'm sorry about these underlines. I don't know where they came from. You patch these all together and you get equations of motion for the horizontal displacement, the vertical displacement, and the angle of an array of disks labeled by n. Uh, you can take the hydrodynamic interaction into account up to whatever order you like, nearest neighbor or all the way, okay? And you get equations of motion in which the basic dynamics of the Crowley problem is augmented by a glide, a lateral glide due to the orientation of the disks. And the orientation of the disks itself changes due to gradients of the velocity fields that the other disks create. Okay? Now the weird thing is, if you think of the disk tilt as a kind of momentum, supposing you forget about this part of the dynamics, u dot is sine theta, theta dot is some derivatives on u. Okay? So if you think of theta or sine theta hardly matters as a kind of momentum, this is saying that u dot, the angle acts like a momentum for the displacement, and the displacement gets a force from, I mean, the, the, the momentum, so-called, gets a force from the second space derivative of the displacement. So it's as though these guys, if you think, if you indulge me and think of theta as a momentum, you actually are getting a kind of effective elastic force, the viscous hydrodynamic interaction is leading to an emergent elasticity acting on the quote-unquote momentum variable. And so, so you can work out in some detail. I Shira? Yes, yes. Wouldn't this argument work for settling rods? Yeah, so in this picture, actually, I, I shouldn't even say disks because the entire dynamics is two-dimensional. It's just rods. And it's all confined narrowly in one direction. So it's an effective in a confined 2D problem, so it is rods. You can think of it as just rods. If you had rods in three dimensions, you'd have two angle variables. If you had disks in three dimensions, also you have two angle variables. All of this is two-dimensional. So it gets a little more complicated with three dimensions. So this thing, the weird thing is this, the dynamics looks like a mass spring array, if you think about it. Um, and you can look for this whole phenomenon in experiments. There were all kinds of fun challenges in the experiments for uh, Rahul, who had to figure out, by the, you know, viscous hydrodynamics is a horrible, it's a sticky business. Placing a bunch of disks, releasing them, you don't, it's not like releasing, you don't drop it and it goes in. If you do that, you'll entrain bubbles. So you have to poise them very gently over the surface, and you have to make sure that you release them simultaneously. The simultaneity across a large distance is not a serious relativistic issue here, but you have to just make sure they're all at the same height, and you have to have a mechanism in which 
you open everything in the same place. All of this is Rahul. Um, and uh, then you can measure, you can measure all kinds of things. Take, you can take super slow movies. You don't have to slow them down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what you will see here at least is they're showing no signs of clumping. And you can see that these guys, at very long times, maybe something funny is happening. You can see that just being disks and settling, they've completely resisted the clumping. They've gone all the way to the bottom of that same container in which the spheres would have clumped like crazy. So shape really matters. If they're a little closer together, then they do still clump. So this is a zoom of this region. You can see the clumping is happening. And this is really the difference between this movie and this movie was uh, the wave number of the uh, perturbation relative to the spacing. Okay. Probably the same thing. So basically, I, I have a feeling these movies are the same. I should have called them something else. I'll check one just to make sure. Yeah, it's the same. But you can see this nice tilting outwards and really playing keep away completely from each other. So that basic idea does seem to be right. Okay. So you can do the linear stability analysis of the problem I talked about. And what you find is a function of wave number in units of uh, units of uh, particle size, I think, I hope, all right, uh, inverse particle size, um, and lattice spacing in units of particle size. You have, so basically, if, if the particles are close enough to each other, the, the Crowley mechanism still go, makes things unstable, up here you're stable. This is a result of a linear stability analysis. And this is the dynamical matrix for that linear stability analysis. You see there's this piece. And you see there's this little piece extra. Okay. This piece is basically Crowley. And your in linear instability condition in terms of a scaled uh, lattice spacing and wave number is this. Basically, uh, you're stable if, if d over a is large compared to cosine squared q. So that's the linear problem is completely solved. That's all there is to it. So you would think, great, we now have a way actually of placing objects and letting, and we are now a way of sort of preventing stuff that's sedimenting from clumping, at least if you arrange the initial conditions well. Okay. Um, and it's even weirder, right? Remember, when you go back here, I don't know how far back I should go here. This is a dispersion relation. So what this means is this system in which I didn't really produce you know, it's not a spontaneously broken symmetry or something. It's the dynamics of the property of the initial state. I've actually got wave-like modes. So I've got some kind of, you know, I should be able to measure that dispersion relation. You can calculate that dispersion relation, and it'll look like this. Okay. Omega. So that is, say, if, if um, the spacing is large enough, this will be a real frequency. Um, and uh, it looks as though you've got a kind of broken symmetry mode. You can measure that mode. So if you take careful, if you analyze the movies carefully, you can actually measure that mode in these systems. Okay. You can, however, also look at the time evolution of a perturbation at some wave number. And you can see that it's wave-like, but at some point it will start to... Uh, Right now, you can't really see a growth in this yet. But maybe if you look at the late time movie, you'll be able to see it. So some kind of clumping is happening, but notice it's a very different type of clumping. What happened, basically, you get pairs of disks joining up and forming these little T's. Now, once you form a T, the disk at the back is completely shielded from the fluid, and that, that thing just settles 
as a composite object. It's only when they get that up close and personal that the nominally, by the way, I should tell you, you know, full disclosure, we've done only a far field analysis. Even when the disks are this close together, we're just doing a far field analysis of the problem, okay? And what happens really is that analysis breaks down only when these guys are really, really touching. But look what happens. It's two of these guys pair off in this funny way. This is just a, a longer, this is a simulation, even though it looks like an experiment. Again, you can see that it's pretty stable for a while. And I think probably maybe this one is so prepared as to stay stable all the way. The spacings and the perturbation have been chosen, the initial condition have been chosen so carefully that it actually stays stable all the way. Okay, all right. Now, supposing you deliberately work in the sector in which the vertical displacement is zero. Then what you have is a couple dynamics of the horizontal displacement and the angle, and that problem is really described by a Hamiltonian. Of course, you can't stay in that sector once you perturb it, but right? If you just look at horizontal displacement and angle, the horizontal displacement, ha and I've done, yeah, it has a kind of spring energy and a funny looking kinetic energy. And this quantity, the sum of all the angles, is actually a conserved momentum in this problem. Okay, so you have Hamiltonian dynamics. And the spring stiffness in this non-dimensional thing is just a number, three halves. Okay, uh, the shape is buried in this quantity alpha V, um, which, is, which comes in as the uh, inverse of the mass. And a rescaled dynamical matrix in terms of U and theta, if you look at the strictly Hamiltonian problem in these rescaled variables, there is an energy and if it weren't for the Crowley physics, if it was just the physics of the angle, the horizontal displacement and the angle, this is your dynamical matrix. It's a simple, it's a, you know, it's, 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 uh, sorry, this, this is your, this is your dynamical matrix for the couple dynamics of the horizontal displacement of the angle, and it's a symplectic dynamics. If you had only Crowley, that's Hermitian, but it's a growing mode. If you put these two together, clearly in general, uh, the matrix is neither, neither uh, real symmetric nor Hermitian nor anything. It's a mess. Okay? So the matrix, each bit, it's a, you can always decompose things into two normal bits. But the two normal bits individually have a nice interpretation. Uh, the combination isn't normal. And whenever your dynamic, uh, by the way, the point is you can always write down a kind of arbitrary description of the dynamics and say things are non-normal. There's a nice notion of energy here for the problem without the Crowley physics, namely the displacement and the angle problem. Okay, and so you can use u squared plus theta squared as the energy, or maybe just for good measure, you can, w is the rescaled vertical displacement, u is the rescaled horizontal displacement, theta is the angle field. And you can use either this or this plus w squared as a more generic measure of the size of a perturbation. And because the dynamical matrix is non-normal, you expect that even in a regime where all the eigenvalues are negative, so the growth is linearly stable, it could be that a given initial perturbation grows for a while uh, before decaying. I'm, all, it's, I'm out of time, right? Oh, no, no, I, I forgot. Yeah, I'm out of time. Oh, so I'm going to finish early, actually, which is just fine, I think. Okay. Um, you can work out the rate of growth of the norm of that, of a general perturbation, and you find it's actually given by the imaginary part of this combination of the horizontal displacement and the vertical displacement. In other words, that perturbations can potentially grow for suitable combinations of horizontal and vertical displacements, okay? And you can work out sort of the, the uh, maximum growth rate mode. Okay, so now the point is this. You've got a problem whose dynamics as a whole is nonlinear. The linear stability analysis tells you that certain states are stable. If it's non-normal, a given perturbation can grow algebraically transiently for a while, even though within the linear theory, it will eventually turn around and decay. However, if that transient algebraic growth is long enough, you will enter a regime where you're no longer entitled to use the linear stability analysis, and some new nonlinear physics will take you away to the instability. Okay. And uh, that essentially is what is seen uh, in this model. So I 
I've forgotten which movie is what. This is a late times movie. Yeah, so this is late times enough that you can actually see the disruption of that initial state. And notice, as I said, this is not the Crowley instability. This is this funny instability that makes these two guys form pairs. So this is evidence for the, you know, the, the type of dynamics we're talking about, the, the stabilization by the tilt and the intervention of a very different kind of instability. Yeah. Now, this is a sort of generic, highly perturbed initial state. And, but even here, you can see sort of interesting pairing off of these guys. And if you, a randomly perturbed initial state will, again, stay stable for a while, but will eventually uh, jump off. There. You can see that, that, that T. Look at that. Okay. So, um, actually, I've come to the end of my talk, and it's not a bad thing, I feel. Okay. So, collective sedimentation is a cool problem. It's got sort of... Uh, you know, this, you know, weird kind of emergent inertia and, a, you know, an association of a, self, a, a persistent velocity with a, when you have a vectorial asymmetry. Uh, in some limits, we're able to find a Hamiltonian description for this purely and completely inertia-less, purely viscous problem. Not, not the only place in the literature where it occurs, but it's a fun example. And I showed you an interesting uh, sort of way of suppressing the instability by introducing an additional variable. Uh, among the things I showed you were an apparent elasticity, if you want to look at it that way, from viscous hydrodynamics. Uh, and general lesson, I mean, certainly for me, this is the first time I'd used the word non-normal in a paper, uh, except perhaps in responses to referees. Um, so eigenvalues are not the whole story, and you can, transient algebraic growth can beat the linear instability. So I was, I've been wondering of late whether there's some way of creating a, creating an, a, a collection of particles which, you know, maybe a, like to settle like this, but have a polarity which stays in the plane. And maybe they can have a dynamics that makes them move horizontally, drawing on the vertical, the energy input from settling. And maybe they can interact and maybe you can create a new kind of active system uh, as a result of vertical driving. So this is a sort of loony idea for the day. And... Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Couple of questions. So, uh, rather than uh, a 1D array, suppose you had a 2D array of disk, is that yeah, stable? Yeah. No, I don't think it's simple. I think it'd probably be fun to do. Uh, <laughs> It will be interesting to see the extent to which one can get this kind of a mechanism to work in 2D. So let's say you had 2D, I don't know, Square 2D lattice. rods, 2D discs. Yeah. Uh, the, the 2D, the, the you know, fully three-dimensional, that is two plus one dimensional, yes. sphere settling problem has been studied mm -hmm. a fair amount. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you could... Uh, Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, that, I suppose that's the way one would go. Um, and you know, you get, the maths is going to be straightforward, but marginally more complicated. You'll have two angle variables. You'll now have a you know quote unquote two dimensional horizontal momentum, if you want to think of it that way, in the form of the angle. And you can write down the dynamics. And certainly, if you wanted to make things that imitated active matter systems, yeah. which had some kind of uh, exactly. intrinsic vector in the plane, exactly. that would be rather fun. So uh, that's going yeah. to be the next question. I was thinking, can you write an effective equation for the in-plane angle and, I, for example, I think in the so. stable I, state? Yeah. Does it look like asters? I don't know. So those are the kinds of things that one could imagine doing. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any, some, any, some, any obvious objection to that idea. A priori, it doesn't strike me as being there being such an objection, but I'm not absolutely sure. It's allowed. Sorry? It's allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. There, are, no, there may be some fatal error I'm making in saying that. Yeah, 
Okay, so uh, uh, it was interesting uh, to find that and find the analogy to the Kepler's or orbit. Right. I was wondering, I mean, Stokes dynamics is actually analogous to electrostatics. Is so, there yeah, any... It's the, same, that, it's the same reason. I mean, the point right. is that when you, you know, the, the 1 over R yeah. made it look like gravity, it can make it look like statics. The mm. screening of fluctuations in homogeneous suspensions has some analogy to electrostatic right. screening. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, all these problems where uh, Stokes hydrodynamics come in, comes in can be made in some cases to look a bit like gravity, in some cases to look a bit like uh, electrostatics. With right. important differences because everything is vectorial and uh, right. so propagators are more complicated mm -hmm. and so more difficult things happen. Yeah, so um, you showed most of the results was for one linear chain right. of settling things, uh, but you also showed the the work with uh, uh, work on drifting lattices. That is right. Is there a version of? Yeah, so I mean, the history of this whole drifting lattices problem goes back to a conversation I had with Christina in 1994, uh, when I walked into her office at what was in those days called ITP, where we were visiting for two different programs. She was there for the flux lattices program and I was there for a biomembranes program. And I asked her what she was working on and she said drifting flux lattices. So then that's actually what prompted us to start writing down the equations for the sort of general hydrodynamic equations of such a system. And for a while we thought that Christina and I and Leon Balance and Matthew Fisher were going to write those equations down together. So those equations exist. So forget about hydrodynamics. Suppose you say you have a two-dimensional system with a two-dimensional displacement field driven in one dimension. So what you will get is various kinematic wave terms, various KPZ terms, and various diffusion-like terms. The number of these terms is large enough that I don't think anyone has had the fortitude to drive, do anything more than even a linear stability analysis. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, you know, uh, let's say you stick to the linear, steadily unstable regime. Probably, given how robust KPZ is, it's very likely that when all the dust settles, you'll end up just getting KPZ scaling. But I don't know. The main thing is these drifting lattice problems. The KPZ nonlinearity comes in from the fact that if you have an object tilted like this or like this, its vertical settling speed will be affected the same way. That is to say. The vertical settling speed is quadratic in the tilt, hence d by dx of uz squared, kpz of nonlinearity. Okay. Uh, and that is essentially that nonlinearity plus a few cross things of that variety are what come in. So everything is marginal in 2D, and so it's probably just a killer. So that prop that those equations exist in our notes and even in the first paper we wrote on this problem. Okay. Uh, Another quick thing is what happens if you turn this upside down? Bubbles. It should be the same. So for, de for deformable things rather than if it's shape? Then it's not upside down the point. If it's deformable bubbles, then it's more complicated. Okay. So okay. then it's sort of. I don't know how to make disc shaped bubbles, but. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, uh, Rama has some Rama things has. on bubbles rising and shape and so forth. That's for one bubble. And that's with a lot of inertia. Right, right, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, the basic message is that uh, vortices slightly reduce the lattice. So the vortex dynamics will be different. So in a bubble, the vortex will be inside the bubble, and in a drop, in a uh, solid object, the bubbles will be outside. They'll be in the form of a wake. So they'll do different things. Thank you.